Okay, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of our Ask an Astronomer program where you get to ask us all about the universe. For those of you, uh, of those of you on uh, Zoom, remember that the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. You can use that to ask us questions. For those of you on social media, you can ask questions in the comments section. I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions today, so uh, do be patient and we'll try to get to those as many, uh, many of those questions as we can. Uh, if you need captions uh, on Zoom, uh, please use the caption button at the bottom right hand part of your screen. Uh, we have a very special guest for you today, uh, but before we get started, I just want to mention an upcoming event. We're very excited. We have another community day uh, coming up uh, this month. Uh, we'll be celebrating Carnival on Saturday. February 13th from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we're going to be exploring the traditions of Carnival as it traveled from Europe to Central and South America. Join us for unique food, masks, music, and dance online. So uh, let's get started with our program. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Jill Tarter. Uh, she's the Emeritus Chair for City Research and a member of the Board of Trustees of the City Institute in Mountain View, California. Uh, Dr. Tarter received her degree in engineering physics with a distinction with distinction from Cornell University and her master's and PhD in astronomy from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she has spent the majority of her professional career attempting to answer the old human question, are we alone, by searching for evidence of technological civilizations out there in space. She served as project scientist for NASA's SETI program and has conducted numerous observational programs at radio observatories all over the world. She has won many awards and accolades during her career, and so here's just a few of the highlights. Uh, she is a fellow of the IIIS, the California Academy of Sciences and the Explorers Club, and she was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people of, in the world in 2004. She's won service awards from NASA, multiple awards for communicating science. She was the 2014 Jansky Lecturer. Uh, in 2018, she was recognized with the Maria Mitchell Woman in Science Award and the Sir Arthur Clarke Innovators Award. Uh, since the termination of funding uh, for NASA's SETI program in 1993, she has served a leadership role in designing and building the Allen Telescope Array and to secure private funding to continue research for the search for life. She even has an asteroid named in her honor, asteroid 74824 Tartar. Uh, many of you are actually already familiar with her work uh, as portrayed, portrayed by uh, Jodie Foster in the movie Contact. Uh, her biography, Making Contact, was written by Sarah Scholes and published in 2017. And so with us uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tarter, uh, who will give us a cosmic perspective on searching for life out there in the universe. And so take it away, Dr. Tarter. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, pleasure to be with you. Uh, I think we need to start by saying SETI is an acronym for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So that's where that comes from. And in order to help you understand how large in scope uh, this search might be, um, how much it might require to be successful, um, I'd like to start and get you to think about where and when you are. And not just I'm sitting in my house and I'm waiting for my next meal, but in a much bigger context, a cosmic context. So let's begin to talk about um, what we mean by here and now. So here, right? As I said, we're sitting in our houses, most of us um, sheltering in place, working at home. And so that's our immediate here. But um, in my case, it's in this house uh, in the Berkeley Hills in uh, Northern California, in the Bay Area of San Francisco. And if we were at the altitude of low Earth um, observing satellites, we would see that here meant on the west coast of the United States of America. And 
since 1968 when Bill Anders took this fantastic Earthrise image as he was coming around the, the limb of the moon, we've been able to see ourselves on a planet orbiting in the vast darkness of space. And a couple of um, summers ago, actually 2013, the Cassini spacecraft, which was orbiting and observing Saturn, turned around and looked back. And I hope you all got the memo and went out and on the lawn and, and waved at Cassini as it took this selfie of all of us here on Earth. There's actually a little tiny dot at the tip of that arrow, and that's us, that's here. Before that, uh, the Voyager spacecraft in 1990, as it was going out of the solar system and passing Neptune, it turned around and captured us here in this beam of uh, sunlight and dust. And this is the pale blue dot that has become so uh, famous with the, uh, the work of Carl Sagan. So we're actually here in the Milky Way galaxy, right? Our star is one of several hundred, uh, excuse me, million stars in the galaxy. And although what I've shown you up until this point have been actual images, uh, this is not an image of the Milky Way because we can't get outside of it to look back and take this image. So this is the image of a large spiral galaxy that we call M101. And this is what we thought our Milky Way galaxy would look like if we could do the job of getting outside to look back. Well, in the optical, we can't see to the center of our galaxy, but if you look at radio wavelengths, and you look at the um, methane and methanol and, and CO, carbon monoxide gases that you can measure at radio wavelengths, you can actually make a map of the Milky Way galaxy from the inside out. And this took something like 15,000 hours of telescope time and it was just completed last spring. But this is what the Milky Way galaxy structure looks like, and when you compare it to what we thought it might look like, it's pretty close, right? There's a much more prominent bar at the center of the, our galaxy than M101. But this is the Milky Way galaxy. And when we use telescopes in orbit in space, like the Hubble Space Telescope, we can take images of many, many, many galaxies out there in the universe. And our galaxy, with its hundreds of billions of stars is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies within the observable universe. And so this is what we mean by here. And you look at all of those points and they're not stars. Each of those points is a galaxy with hundreds of millions of stars. And you can see that some of them are smaller and fainter. Right? And that's because they're farther away. And so this image really um, reminds us that as we look farther out in space, we're looking farther back in time because of the tyranny of light speed. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, this is our reference, our cosmic reference for here, but what's our cosmic reference for now, right? And now is um, the, uh, the, the place we are in a 13.8 billion year continuing evolution of the cosmos. And we have to confess that although this is the most self-consistent picture of cosmic evolution that we can paint today, um, not everyone is comfortable with this because this image um, of cosmic evolution is actually looking at only about 4% of the mass energy density of our cosmos. There's 96%, which we call dark energy and dark matter, right? 
Dark just means we don't know. We don't have a clue what that material is, but um, we can do a very good job of looking back in time and mapping what we understand of cosmic evolution onto the data that we can collect. And that works really well all the way back to the in first instance of the Big Bang cosmic explosion. And when we get back to those earliest times, 10 to the minus 31 seconds, suddenly we cannot make gravity and quantum mechanics play nice together. So this is an ongoing exploration to understand the earliest, earliest moments of our cosmos. And although these are long ago and far away events, humans are actually intimately connected to those events. Why is that? Well, because humans trace their lineage not just back through the centuries of our families and not just back through the millennia of our art and our architecture and our various experiments with governance, not just back over the millions of years since we branched off evolutionary from the apes, we trace our lineage not just back over the 2.4 billion years during which Earth's atmosphere has been perfused with oxygen thanks to the photosynthetic labors of cyanobacteria. And not just back to the formation of the sun and our solar system, something like 4.568 billion years ago, right? We have to go back to trace our lineage millions of years before that where there was a large, enormous cloud of molecular gas that was polluted with the um, output of Wolf Rayet stars and the debris of previous generations of stars, supernova remnants, like this modern one that I'm showing there, right? Because before this cloud collapsed to form our solar system, the iron that's in the hemoglobin of your blood and the calcium in your bones and all the elements that are heavier than helium that make you you were fused long ago deep within massive stars that ended their lives in catastrophic Convolutions, uh, convulsions, leaving behind remnants such as this modern one, or they were created when the end product of stellar evolution, some white dwarfs, collided together to give conditions that could make things like gold, platinum, right? So literally, quite literally, you and I and all of us are made of stardust. And it's taken a while for scientists to fully understand that it really does take a cosmos to make a human. And we've been looking at this story of cosmic evolution and human evolution um, for millennia. And we are going to continue down this road of exploration and continue our journey because we're still curious about um, who we are and why we are and, and what else might be out there, right? So this journey uh, is an extremely exciting one, particularly today. And over the course of my career to get to today, there have been two astonishing game changers. The first is the discovery of extremophiles and the second, the discovery of exoplanets. So when I was a student, I was taught that life could only exist in a narrow range of physical environments, 
We couldn't be too hot, we couldn't be too cold, we couldn't be too acidic or too basic. The pressure had to be one bar or so. Uh, and the radiation environment had to be quite benign. But the discovery of extremophiles, organisms living um, in, in ice, in boiling battery acid, in the volcano, volcanic uh, areas, living beneath the oceans at the seafloor where there's extremely high pressure and temperature and very little light uh, around black smokers and finding life in the most basic and acidic environments on the planet. These extremophiles have shown us that life is much more inventive than we once thought. And so the conditions in which life can thrive are much broader than we ever imagined when I was a student. And of course, the second game changer is the discovery of exoplanets and perhaps in the near future, exomoons. So when I was a student, we knew of only nine planets in our solar system and we've since declassified one of those. We had no idea whether planets would be frequent or very rare. And we had two theories of planet formation um, that we couldn't decide between. And had one of them turned out to be correct, planets would have been very rare. But it turns out that that wasn't the correct theory uh, of planetary formation. And we now know that there are more planets than stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and presumably all the other galaxies within the observable universe. So that, um, those two game changers work together to tell us that there is more potentially habitable real estate um, in our cosmos than we once had ever imagined. And so, what is so exciting about today is that we know there is a lot of potentially habitable real estate out there. And we are beginning to develop the tools to explore to see if any of it is actually inhabited. And that's, that's what SETI is all about, looking for life, intelligent life beyond Earth. And because of the finite speed of light, Phil Morrison, an early pioneer in the topic of SETI, liked to tell us that SETI is the archaeology of the future. All right, it's archaeology because it's taken any evidence of techno signatures and the electromagnetic spectrum that we might discover. It's taken it a long time to get there. So it's actually, if there's information embedded, it's telling us about their past. But the important thing is if we succeed with SETI searches, then we know that we can have a long future. Why do we say that? It's because in order for SETI to be successful, to find evidence of someone else's technology, um, that technology has to be extremely long lived. SETI will not succeed unless another technological civilization out there is close to us. And that's not just close in space, but close in time, being co-temporal. So in the long 10 billion year history of the Milky Way galaxy, the only way that two technical civilizations could overlap in time is if the technologies are long lived. So SETI tells us that we have the potential for a long future or successful detections in SETI tell us that. And I think that this is an incredibly powerful message to come from this scientific exploration. And before we actually succeed with the detection if we ever do. Uh, SETI has a very powerful role to play for humanity. 
I think that talking to you about SETI <clears throat> is like holding up a mirror, holding up a mirror to all of us on this planet and saying, see, when compared to something else that evolved independently elsewhere in the cosmos, you, we are all the same. It's an opportunity to um, provide a perspective that trivializes the differences between human beings. And I think this more cosmic perspective is extraordinarily important because we face challenges to our long future uh, on this planet, challenges that do not respect national boundaries, food security, water security, climate change, all of these challenges are going to require global solutions and cooperations among humans who we sometimes think are very different. But when compared to something else evolving independently on another planet out there means that in fact, we are all the same and we need to work globally to find solutions to these challenges. So my last words actually come from Caleb Scharf, the chairman of the astrobiology department at Columbia University. And Caleb reminds us on a finite world, the finite world that we saw with the Earthrise picture that Bill Anders took in 1968, on a finite world, a cosmic perspective is not a luxury, it's a necessity. So thank you. Kevin, back to you. Great. Uh, we definitely need that cosmic perspective given what's happening in the world. And so thank you for that. That was great. Uh, we do have uh, a number of questions uh, from our audience, and I think a good one to start out with. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about uh, exoplanets, and so we had a question about exoplanets from Kim, and she uh, says, good morning, and uh, she's enjoying her, the presentation. Uh, she's a longtime fan, and she wanted to ask, uh, how often can two planets be found in the habitable zone, like uh, Teagarten B and C? Um, we're finding that the architectures of different planetary systems are extraordinarily diverse. And many planetary systems don't look anything like our own solar system. So since um, on average, every star has at least one planet, uh, the stellar systems with more than one planet are quite abundant. Right. And we can't yet distinguish between um, what's necessity to form a solar system and what's contingent on the way it actually ends up. So there's lots to learn on that topic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Francis just asked a follow-up question that's just really good. Uh, could, do you think that asteroids could possibly be habitable? Good question. Um, because every time we've said, oh no, that can't be, because you need an atmosphere, for example, to have life. Um, you know, we've turned out to be mistaken and too narrow-minded. Um, asteroids might certainly be a habitat for an advanced technological civilization, which could use those uh, asteroids as platforms for their robots and exploration. So not willing to say no to anything because I've been wrong too many times before. Right, right, sure, sure. Um, uh, along similar lines, uh, let's see, uh, Lakshaya asked, uh, could life exist on Titan, the, the moon of Saturn? Very interesting question. And we're certainly gonna send robotic probes to try and answer that question. Yes, um, yeah. Titan has a very thick atmosphere. It has lakes and rivers, but they're not made of water. They're made of liquid hydrocarbons. Um, we don't know what chemistry at lower rates in colder temperatures might have produced, but they may have produced something that we would call alive. 
And so that's a very good target for future robotic exploration of our solar system, as are the moons of, of uh, Jupiter and Enceladus and Callisto and Ganymede, right? Sure. These worlds we know are frozen on the outside. They're covered in ice, but that ice has cracks. And out of those cracks, we're seeing cryovolcanism. We're seeing some activity underneath the ice spewing out um, water from those salty oceans. And so we're also looking at missions that will ex fly through these plumes, sample them with a mass spectrometer and look to see if there's anything like long-chained hydro hydrocarbons, which might indicate the presence of life at the bottom of these distant oceans, just as life exists around black smokers on the bottom of the Earth's oceans. Okay. That's the uh, Dragonfly mission, correct? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Just, yeah if people want to know a little bit more about that mission, uh, take a look at the NASA home, uh, webpage and look for the Dragonfly mission. It's really kind of exciting, you know. And uh, uh, another, another uh, similar uh, question, uh, speaking of small objects in the solar system, uh, uh, someone asked the question, oh, I'd love to hear Dr. Tartar's thoughts on the Aumuamua objects. That's been in the news recently, right? <laughs> A Muamua, a visitor yeah. from another solar system. Uh, very intriguing. Everybody that I know who is my age remembers Arthur Clarke's right. Rendezvous with Rama. Right, right sure. He entered our solar system that was shaped like a cigar and turned out to be a spacecraft. Yeah. Um, a Muamua came and went very quickly. So we didn't have a lot of opportunity to study it. We did. Um, use the SETI facilities at the Allen Telescope Array and at Green Bay, West Virginia, to um, observe to see if we could find any signals coming from that object. Didn't find any, um, but it doesn't mean that uh, we might not in the future with different tools and observations and indeed additional um, examples of a Muamua from different solar systems. We might be able to find something that indicates technology or, um, or life from beyond Earth. There's a new book out by Avi Loeb on this topic. Um, you know, somebody who works on SETI can't possibly with any kind of, uh, any kind of a straight face say that far out ideas are impossible because we were a far out idea for a very long time. So they, this is the first, and there has been a second of what will probably be a very large number of bodies that enter our solar system from another solar system. And over time, we will begin to learn something more about the composition and the nature of these um, visitors and therefore about distant solar systems that we can't directly sample. Or maybe one of them will turn out to be yeah. a spacecraft. Right, <laughs> sure, sure, possible. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, so going back to uh, uh, exoplanets, uh, Barbara asks, uh, when did we reach consensus that there are more planets than stars in our galaxy? That conclusion is the result of the Kepler spacecraft's four years of, of observing. We could, Kepler was staring at one particular uh, area on the sky and looking at all the planets within its field of view and looking for transits, looking for um, times when one of these many stars that it was looking at simultaneously dimmed because a planet passed in front of the star and cast a shadow. And with a lot of careful work, you can look at the detection rate 
of planets around these Kepler stars. And you can think about the, uh, how many you were missing, right? The incompleteness of the search. And you can take the statistics from that area of the sky and uh, extend it to four pi steridians, to the whole sky. And that is what tells you that there are actually more planets than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, that's really a, a surprising, I guess some people find it surprising that uh, uh, the- I found this, it really good. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the surprising uh, thing that a lot of people find is that, uh, you know, this is really all really quite recent. You know, uh, Barbara asked when, well, it's only within the last, uh, what, 10, 15 years that we've had yeah. real <laughs> solid evidence uh, of these exoplanets. We've always suspected, you know, our suspicions about uh, planets orbiting around stars go back more than 400 years, uh, Gio, Giordano Bruno and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's only recently that we've actually gotten this real hard evidence that these objects really exist out there and in great numbers. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So 51 peg B right, right. Right? Yeah. earned Nobel prize for its two discoverers. And right. that opened up a whole new era. And that right. was, you know, just right. a little while ago. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. Uh, well, speaking of uh, life uh, in the universe uh, out there in the universe, uh, uh, Grizel, on uh, this is a question from Facebook. Uh, she writes, uh, "Science fiction tends to depict extraterrestrials looking somewhat human. How likely is that? Is it that life on other worlds are similar to us, given the difference different difference in the real estate?" <laughs> yeah, so that's a really good point. We co we co evolved with this planet, mm -hmm. and that no doubt has set our physiology and the way we look. I think that the fact that science fiction, in particular science fiction movies before CGI, right. um, depicted uh, extraterrestrials as so pseudo-humans, it was just a lack of imagination and actually before computer animation, a lack of the ability to get some, some actor in some kind of latex costume that didn't end up looking uh, humanoid. So there are lots of opportunities, I think, for life to be different than life on this planet. And that makes it kind of hard to decide how you would go looking for that life. Uh, what is the basic chemistry that results from biology? How might you remotely sense that? And how might you look for techno signatures from something that was totally unlike human life? In case of the techno signatures, if, if there's some transmitters that are needed to send the information, then perhaps you can say that the life or the biology would be meter scale as opposed to microscopic because building a transmitter, um, doing the engineering requires some size. The laws of physics are also gonna limit what's possible, but there again, we don't yet understand all of physics. We can't indeed create a branching ratio to say, well, you know, when you do this experiment with this same kind of initial conditions, sometimes it'll go this way, sometimes it'll go another way, what's the percentage? So um, I think that uh, life that co-evolved with Titan, for example, or Enceladus, or um, Proxima Centauri B could in fact be quite different than life as we know it, but yet the laws of physics uh, will dictate what we can do with our technology to possibly discover someone else's technology or life on another uh, body. 
And the, the basic answer is, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, along those lines, uh, uh, I see that uh, Sherwood, uh, Sherwood Waggy is in the audience. Uh, hi, Sherwood. It's been a while since I've seen him, but when he was in New Jersey, he was a member of one of our local astronomy clubs. And uh, he asks, uh, uh, among all the electro electromagnetic magnetic waves that we could monitor, how do we decide which ones are worthwhile? Or is there technology now or in development that can watch all of them? Ah, uh, well, Back in the end of the last century, we held some workshops at the SETI Institute uh, and published a report that we called SETI 2020, what we should be doing for the next 20 years. One of those, the first thing it said is not only radio, let's do optical SETI. And so we began doing that. It said, build your own telescope so that you can be on the air 24 seven. You can see behind me the Allen Telescope Array that we built to do SETI and radio astronomy at the same time. And the third recommendation was figure out a way to look at all the sky, all the time, at all frequencies in order to be sensitive to transient events, something that occurs just once and is short-lived. And if you don't happen to be looking at the right piece of the sky at the time, you will miss it. So that last, um, recommendation is something that we're just beginning to tackle, right? And in fact, it's happening first at optical wavelengths rather than radio. We're building, there are a couple of systems that are being developed. One is called PanoSETI that's coming out of the UC San Diego system with Shelley Wright as the PI. Another is called Laser SETI that's being done at the SETI Institute with Elliot Gillum as the PI. And these programs will build facilities um, in the Northern and Southern hemispheres and around the equator that are literally looking at all the sky all the time and will have sensitivity to transient events that are as short as a nanosecond, as long as um, a second. And it's a really extremely exciting. And among other things, not only might we detect lasers, right? But right. we might detect other phenomena of the cosmos that we have not had the time uh, resolution and the uh, total coverage of the sky to find. So there might be new, some new astrophysics coming out of that as well as a search for techno signatures. So yeah, all the sky, all the time at all frequencies. And wow. if you do all frequencies, then you're going to be um, necessarily doing some of that work above the Earth's atmosphere because we have um, limited transmission at many frequencies through the Earth's atmosphere. So you're gonna want a platform say on the far side of the moon, which never has the earth in its sky. You have no um, <clears throat> radio frequency interference and no light pollution from the earth if you are in a lunar far side location. However, that's gonna be more expensive than doing it from the ground. So I think if that's going to happen, it's going to be because astronomers and physicists decide to build some infrastructure on the lunar far side to do their science. And perhaps we can piggyback on that and do commensal observing, observing at the same time as someone else from the lunar far side. Yeah, great, great, fantastic. Uh, speaking of uh, radio telescopes, uh, Elsa asks, uh, did you ever work at Arecibo and do you think it will be ever, ever be rebuilt again? Yeah, I spent a lot of time at Arecibo a great deal of time and really loved the place, loved the scientists and uh, technicians who maintain that telescope. Um, and the tragedy to lose it because it had unique capabilities. Right. Not only was it a very large collecting area that could be added into networks of other telescopes around the world to, to search for gravitational waves and improve the sensitivity of that um, pulsar timing network extremely, um, it, it made a huge boost to that. But 
Arecibo also had a planetary radar associated with it. So you take a couple megawatt transmitter and you focus it with this very large dish and you point it at asteroids or the surface of Venus. Um, and you can actually, by listening for the return echo from this radar beam off of a surface, you could make a map of asteroids or Venus uh, in a way that it's not possible to do anywhere else with that kind of sensitivity. So that was a big loss to the scientific community. As to whether it will be rebuilt, there is certainly a proposal that has been now submitted uh, to, the <clears throat> to the National Science Foundation for a next generation Arecibo. Uh, it would have moving parts that Arecibo did not have so that you in fact can steer it uh, in, um, in azimuth and elevation in a way that you, you couldn't with the fixed Arecibo dish. And whether or not that will get built is going to be uh, very dependent on the results of the ongoing decadal review of astronomy and astrophysics. In fact, Arecibo is a bit late to the game, um, but that proposal will in fact be considered. And whether the astronomy community, the science community has a, an appetite big enough to rebuild this telescope as opposed to all the other ideas for new kinds of telescopes that have been proposed is yet to be determined. Okay, let's see. Um, actually, I'd like to uh, share my screen here. I have a little image to uh, share with you, uh, Jill. Let me stop uh, sharing mine. Oh, I think I can do that directly. Here we go. So uh, uh, I got, uh, I have this picture here that was sent to me by <laughs> Hannah, who is a little girl. Uh, she's eight years old. She's from Bloomfield, New Jersey. And she is a big fan of your work. She's your, your biggest fan here in New Jersey. And she uh, uh, wrote about uh, that she, she loves your, your work and she loves how you study the stars. And so, uh, so I just wanted to put that up for, for you to, to bring, bring a little light to your day. And uh, do you have any advice for, for young people like Hannah and the other young people that might be watching today if they want to become an astronomer or they want to search for life in the universe? Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, well, first of all, Hannah, thank you very much for that image. It's a, it's a kind of a copy of an image from a really great book called um, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Right. Um, it talks, has little vignettes about a large number of female scientists and and I think it's, it's a great read for young, for young women. Um, Hannah, find something you love to do. Something that makes you feel um, happy and uh, uh, complete. And then work really hard at doing whatever you need to do to become the best person at doing this particular job because once you've developed skills that give you tools, you'll find those tools can be uh, applied to all kinds of different problems. And Hannah, as opposed to someone like me, who's basically done the same thing for their entire career, I think your future career path is going to um, revolve around doing many different things as new technologies and new capabilities and new job categories that we can't even define today show up. I think you're gonna be well served by having a really um, powerful skill set, And then the pleasurable thing will be looking around and deciding what would be the most fun questions to apply your tools kit to solving. Okay, that's a great answer. The part of that tool set is math. Don't yes. forget that. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So uh, Bob asks an interesting question. Uh, thank you for speaking to us today, Dr. Tartar. Do you feel it's more likely life on Earth appeared here first or appeared elsewhere, for example, on Mars and was transferred here? 
So this is a, <clears throat> a, a field of study that we call panspermia, right? right? We know that um, on Earth, we have pieces of the moon and Mars, chunks of rock that we collected in the Antarctic in the spring. When the snow melts and you see these dark objects in, in the uh, melt pools. And so we know it's possible to transfer rocks between the planets of our solar system. And we can understand that it's possible that microbes could have hitched a ride on those rocks and transferred life, for example, from Mars. So a, a big impact on Mars chipped off these rocks and gave them enough velocity to, to leave the gravitational field of Mars and eventually be captured by the gravitational field of the Earth. Um, so we know it's possible to transfer material between planets. It's uh, statistically more favorable to go from Mars to Earth than it is from Earth to Mars, but both are possible. And so far, uh, as we have examined these pieces of Martian meteorites, we have found structures, microscopic structures, that some people have claimed actually um, indicate biology on Mars, life on Mars. The community, uh, when these claims were made, uh, really got excited. And uh, the, the great thing about it was that that excitement produced many new tools for studying microscopic amounts of material and really push the field forward. I think the community has decided um, that what we're seeing is geology, not biology, although there are some people who still say, no, that's, that's really all of the, the number of different clues indicate that what we might be seeing is fossilized life. So first of all, it tells you that it's a difficult question to answer. There's a lot of ambiguity about whether it's geology or biology. And second, um, that it's a really interesting question. We could in fact be, but we could all in fact be Martians, right? Uh, we don't yet know the answer to that. But. Right. And uh, we uh, really have uh, only uh, time for maybe one more question. And uh, maybe we should have addressed this question when we started rather than here at the end. But uh, Lynn asks, you know, how is life defined? How do we know when we found life? Lynn, I just bypassed that question, <laughs> right? Because I don't have an answer. Nobody really has a, an all-encompassing answer. Although a new field called synthetic biology, which may in fact end up creating life in a test tube, uh, may provide us enough information to define life. I don't worry about the definition. I simply say, I'm looking for technology that some technologists uh, produced and I really don't care <laughs> what they're like and how limited or unlimited they are in terms of their capabilities. Um, so I don't need to define life. I just need to say I'm looking for something that has the ability to build and operate a transmitter. Right, right, great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Charter. This has been a fascinating uh, conversation about life out there in the universe. And so we hope that everyone has uh, enjoyed this. And uh, so uh, we're going to be signing off. Uh, remember, we do have some upcoming events uh, yeah, at the museum. Can I give people and, a homework oh, assignment? Oh, sure, yeah, homework assignment. Yes, of course. So and, on all of these electronic devices that we all enjoy, right. you usually have a profile, right, that says something about you. Well, I would be very pleased if people would go in and edit their profiles mm -hmm. so that the first thing they say about themselves is that they're an earthling. <laughs> um, then I would like them to try and behave like that. <laughs> right, right. Good, good assignment.
good assignment. <laughs> Hope everyone does that. So uh, uh, we're going to be uh, signing off here. Uh, we do have some upcoming uh, programs. Uh, uh, join us on Friday. We have another happy hour event uh, online uh, for the Newark Museum. And uh, we also have on Sunday a, a dance class, The Principles of Hip Hop. So, so check those out, out on our website, newyorkmuseumart.org. And so uh, let me leave you with a, a little, uh, a couple of lines here from, from a poem. Uh, Sarah Williams was, I believe, a 19th century poet, and she uh, wrote a, a poem called The Old Astronomer to His Pupil, and it's all about the, the astronomer passing the torch uh, to the younger generation. And there's a famous line from this poem that says, though my, my soul may set in darkness, it will rise in perfect light. I love the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. And so with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Tarter, and uh, thank you to all of everyone in the audience. And so... Uh, Farewell and uh, dark skies to you and happy stargazing. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.